Hey everyone, for my first episode of Salvi Sunday, I'm going to show you how to make a pickup winder with an accurate turn counter out of a sewing machine, a calculator, and a few other things you can find around the house. The first thing we need to do is find a variable speed motor. And the best platform for our purposes is a sewing machine. They're cheap, they're readily available, and they give us a lot of surface area to glue different accessories on. And they're also very easy to control with the foot pedal. Now we could just mount the bobbin on here and start winding, but that's not accurate. We need a way to count the rotation so that we can more accurately wind the pickups. There's several different ways that we could do this, but I think I have a good idea of how to salvage some parts to make a counter. My first thought was to use a reed switch. How a reed switch works is that whenever a magnetic field is introduced, one of the reeds are attracted to it, making it contact the other reed. This creates a circuit. This should work perfectly to trigger our turn counter. The only issue now is finding one. We could get one from Radio Shack or order one online, but I wanted to find one around the house. So I started thinking about the different places I could find one, and I remembered these old magnetic door alarms I have that have been broken for years. One of those should be a perfect donor. But before we continue, I want to point out that while the reed switch is certainly a good option, I discovered another way to trigger that seems to be more effective at high speeds. For all you engine mechanics out there, the problem with the reed switch is very similar to valve float. That is, at high RPMs, the reed, just like a valve, can have trouble returning to position before its next cycle. This means that at high speeds, we'll begin getting two or more rotations per count, and this isn't good. The second method shown in this video is the method I personally prefer but I wanted to leave in the parts about the reed switch so you can all experiment and find your own preferred solution. So let's continue. Let's see if this has a reed switch. And sure enough, there one is. Let's get a close up on that. First thing we need to do is get this reed switch off of this board. There we go. Now that we have a reed switch removed, we need to find something we can use as a counter for the switch to trigger. And I think I have a perfect candidate. Now I remember being a kid, pressing one plus one equals, and every time you hit it, the number goes up by one. And that's exactly what we need for a counter. So now what we need to do is take it apart and see how we can connect the switch to it. So let's do that. I want to be careful not to break anything here. It should just split apart. There we go. So we have all these circuits here next thing we're going to need to do is shave off these plastic rivets. They melt this plastic over and it kind of mushrooms over the, the board here. And that's what keeps this board attached. So we need to remove that very carefully. We're going to be using a sharp chisel. We we'll want to remove all of those so that we can pull this board out. Yeah, we don't want to push too hard or we can slip and really screw this thing up. All right, now that should pop right out. Now on this side, we don't have anything we can solder to, so we need to figure out where the equals button is. It's this right here. 
Now how these buttons work is that these and this rubber sleeve come down and short these out. Where you see that kind of copper colored space, that fiberglass behind there? That's where these two circuits are split. So what we have is we have this hole here and that hole there. That would be the positive and negative side of this connection. So what we need to do is get those holes in the back, figure out where they are and solder our wires to those. So let's see. It's right there. So we have this hole and this hole. Right there and right there. So what we need to do is strip this coating off and we're going to solder to those. Now what I'm going to do is trace these spots to somewhere where it's more convenient to solder. So this top one goes along here, comes up and it's right there. That'll be an easy spot to solder to. Now we need to take this one, it's the next one underneath it, and trace that out. That goes up here. So that right there will be another convenient spot to solder. So now what we need to do is take this coating and scrape it off of these two spots. What I have here is a micro chisel that I made out of a uh, precision screwdriver. I'm going to use that to scrape the coating off of this to expose this metal here so that we can solder to it. You want to be careful not to uh, tear the metal because if we do then we'll break the connection. Okay, now that should be enough there. And that should be enough there. Now we have some metal exposed that we can solder to. Let's start by getting a tiny bit of flux on there. I'm just going to use a toothpick. Let's tend this iron a bit. Okay, now let's get some solder on these. You see it turning silver there, that means the solder's sticking to it. All right, now we need to get our wires. Now that we have our wires ready, we want to wet them with solder so that they'll stick to that easily. Want to make sure they're saturated with solder. Now, let's solder these on. We don't want to hold on there too long, we just want enough to get that solder to melt and stick to that board where we expose the metal. And there we go. Now that joint right there will be really weak, so what we want to do is use a little bit of glue to hold this wire in place so we're not flexing that joint because any stress on that joint could make that metal peel off. I'm going to use super glue. Now you could use hot glue. I just prefer super glue because it's quick and convenient. Don't have to get a gun ready or anything. I'm actually going to cover the solder joint as well. Just to be extra safe that we don't stress that joint and break it. I'm going to hit that with a little bit of accelerator. And now that joint's nice and strong. We don't have to worry about that wire flexing and tearing this off. So now we need to get our next one. We want to bend this wire into a position where we can easily hold it onto that. Let's get the iron. Okay. 
Okay. Not quite. There. Now, do the same thing. I'm going to glue this over here first. And hit that. Then I'm going to glue back here to hold both of these wires together so that we're not flexing them anymore. Okay, now that we have those glued up, let's get this put back together and give it a shot. All right, now that we have it back together, let's check it out and see how it works. Let's see, one plus one. There we go. I just want to stop here quick to warn you that not all calculators will work. I tried several before this one and all of them either had flimsy unsolderable plastic circuits or didn't add one every time you press equals. So I recommend buying name brand calculators which are only around 5 bucks. Make sure the calculator is one of the thicker ones as this is likely a good indication that they contain a solid circuit board. And be sure that it will continue to add one every time the equals button is pressed. All calculators will be different but the process will be almost identical. Now all we need to do is connect our reed switch to these and every time the magnet turns and passes it, it will register as one. Now that we have our wires whipped with solder, all we need to do is connect the reed switch to those. Got a couple little pieces of shrink tape on there, shrink tubing. Get these wires bent so it's easy to solder on. There's one. And there's the other. All right, let's give this a shot. One plus one looks like it's gonna work now we just need to set this up on the sewing machine the first thing I want to do is mount this calculator to the frame of the sewing machine so what I'm going to do is put some masking tape on these two edges here. Let's see how this fits. It's about perfect. All right. So now I'll put that right there. So like we need some glue right along this top edge. We'll get that mounted on there. Hit it with the accelerator. And that should hold pretty well for now. Lay it on its back and get this back side too. And that should make it pretty secure but I'll be able to remove it later. So now let's get this reed switch attached next to the spindle here so that we can set a magnet up to activate the switch. Let's get a close up here. So the first thing I want to do is affix a magnet to the spindle here. What I want to do is use some tape, wrap the spindle up in it so that we can remove the magnet later if we want to. All right. Get some super glue, put it on the back of this magnet. I'm actually going to sand this magnet a little bit to give it some texture because it's a bit smoother and I don't think the glue will hold well. Now that we have it a little roughed up, it should adhere a lot better. So now let's put some glue on it. Got 
our accelerant ready. Put it right there. Hit it with the accelerant and let it set. There we go. Now we need to place the reed switch close enough to where it'll activate. So let's see here. Do one plus one equals. Okay, now that's working. So let's see if we put it there. That's working. So we'll just mount it about right there. And again, as always, I use masking tape so that I can remove it later. And we'll get the switch oriented where we can glue it easily. Put some glue on there. Get our accelerator. Now, with the pedal, let's give it a shot. If you didn't notice before, this magnet is tripping the reed switch twice per pass. I thought it was just a fluke of how I was holding it before, but after this I realized that the magnet I was using had both a north and a south pole along the face, which was causing the double tripping. I switched to another magnet after this, but didn't film that part. Just make sure that your magnet only has one pole on the side you're passing the switch with. Now let's move on to the second method of triggering the calculator. If you don't have a reed switch, there's another way we can make this work. The idea here is to glue some conductive tape, some kind of metal tape, you can use shielding tape. And if you don't have any of that, then you can use HVAC tape, the aluminum kind of tape. That should work too. I just wanted to add really quick that you could glue or tape on a piece of pop can, aluminum foil, or any other thin conductive metal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get these wires to touch the spindle here, and then have a small section of tape to where when that tape comes around, it shorts out these two connections and uh, adds a number to this. The first thing we're gonna do is put a piece of tape here. Then I have a small piece of scrap wood that I'm gonna glue to that so I can attach my wires to it. Put a little bit of glue on there. I'm gonna attach that to the tape. Now that'll give us a platform to glue these wires to. So now we need to get these wires to where they're in contact with the spindle here. We want the wires to be tilting this way so that we're spinning with it. If we have it up this way, it's gonna dig in. So we'll get the first wire there. Glue that on. Now we need to get the other wire in position too. I want to make sure it's not contacting the other wire because we want that tape to short it out. You can see that the wires aren't touching. Now I want to get a small piece of shielding tape. A piece about this big should be just enough. We'll attach the tape in the same area of the spindle that the wires are on. Now, as that passes the wires, when they're both on that tape, it'll short these two wires out. Let's get a better look at the calculator. works perfectly. You can find most of that stuff around the house and any of that stuff can be found at Lowe's. You don't have to go find a reed switch if you don't have a radio shack near you. You can just get some aluminum or copper shielding tape. Get your wires up against that spindle and that'll trigger it. And with this calculator you have a perfectly accurate counter. Let's try this again. One 
plus one equals and now we have an accurate counter now that I have the bobbin wound I'm gonna set up these guides to keep the wire from going outside of the bobbin as I wind it what I did is I just glued this wooden dowel and then I have these washers I'm gonna glue into place but first to make this a little bit wider and to let the wire slip over it a little more easily I'm gonna add a little bit of shrink tubing now I can slide the washers on there most washers will have like a smooth edge and a rough edge you want to make sure that the smooth edge is on the inside of where your wire will be then I'll just line those up and glue them from the outside we don't want any glue on the inside or the wire might snag on it and hang up all right now that we got everything set up let's give this thing a shot Got about 20 winds on there right now, so we'll do 20 plus one. And it should continue to go up from there. Now we're at 8,000 wines. Let's check the DC resistance. And we are at 6.2 kilo ohms, just where I wanted it. Now all that's left is to give you a sample of what this pickup sounds like. Here's a short excerpt from an interview I did with a client about his Nautilus guitar. If you enjoyed the video, please like, share, and subscribe because I'll be putting out more videos just like this in the near future. Thanks for watching. Middle pickup. Mm. Right there, now you just hear it. <laughs> there's where it turns into the strat, yeah. which is like, man, not being a strat player, I think I'm gonna really dig this strat tone to just start exploring new tones. And it's cool because all I need is this guy, which um, was the whole goal. Mm -hmm.